From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined with our guest super producer returning, Max White Pants Williams. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Look, the world is full of increasingly bizarre stories now. Uh, are there more than there were in the past, or is it just easier to find them? That's a question for another evening. What we do know is it can be tough to keep track of everything. That's why many people in the West were probably surprised to learn that the president of Venezuela came out on social media and in official press releases uh, pretty recently and said that he might just, you know, F around and invade the neighboring, much smaller nation of Guyana. Pause, I'll have that. rewind. What? Here are the facts. I don't know. Like, we all heard of Guyana, or we've all heard of Venezuela. Maybe we start there because we haven't. I don't think a lot of people think about Guyana. I just know French Guyana. Is that the same thing or is that Mm-mm. a different Guyana? No, it's yeah, a different see, place. Yeah. I only know it because of the French attached to it because I'm such a, you know, Western minded fool. Um, well, this but, this yeah. was well known in some circles as British Guyana for a long time yes. before it became independent. Uh, uh, there's a lot. To learn. There's actually a ton to learn about Venezuela. Ben, I think I think most people don't know anything about Venezuela either. I mean, once again, really? for me, it's mainly the name, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. it w- Venezuela, if we think back, was in the news quite a bit when Hugo Chavez was running mm-hmm. it and there was like tension between the U.S. and Venezuela, right? Largely around oil and how it is traded with what currency. Remember that, everybody? Right. <laughs> Shout out confessions of an economic hitman. Exactly. But I, you know, I just, I was looking through ye old CIA world fact book again uh, and just Looking at how little I know actually about Venezuela. Is See, that video yeah. out online yet? Not yet. I don't know. Okay, well, we've got a little little teaser for that very book uh, coming out on the social medias. Keep an eye out. But yeah, it's just it's something it's something you can look at online. By the way, you don't need a physical book. The World right. CIA Fact Book. Check it out. I would also uh, fact check the CIA's claimed facts. Oh, of definitely. Course. Yes. Oh, yeah. We, we mentioned in the video that they're the opinions and facts about the world. <laughs> well, if there's nothing that we've learned uh, doing this show and hopefully you out there listening to the show is to always double check the quote unquote <laughs> facts. Triple check if you can. I, I want to um, shout out to one of my favorite talk shows of all time, which was Hugo Chavez's Allo Presidente, uh, wherein, yeah, he had a talk show that would go however long he wanted it to go. Uh, where in the midst of being sort of a despot, uh, you could see clips on this on YouTube, I think, he would uh, he would set up in kind of like somewhere between a radio thing and an Oprah Winfrey thing, and he would just take what I can only imagine are very closely screened calls from the populace. It's funny, it reminds me of a thing that happens in the movie Casino, where A. Rothstein, played by uh, Robert De Niro, sort of gets deposed because he, to, due to legal struggles, he can't do his casino manager job, so they just give him this talk show where he just takes pot shots at like the uh, governmental entities that are preventing him from doing the job he really wants to do. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, but the whole thing about, the, about Venezuela is that it has such a a rot history in you know coups and uh, fights for power and which ended up in i think it was 99 when hugo chavez was elected president and then he lasted until he passed away in 2013 of cancer uh, from cancer that he alleged was you know done to him by some powers in the west Mm -hmm. and then you get nicolas maduro who was his number two in command and he has been in power since then ever since and shows no signs of abdicating Mm-mm. A quick question. How, do we have any proof of uh, giving someone cancer as an assassination tool? Is that a thing that has uh, yeah. been attempts determined have been to made. be possible? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Attempts like, have been made. By, well, by, by, cancer, again, is such an umbrella mm-hmm. term. Right. It's, a, it's a revolution. Feeding them of carcinogens, themselves. perhaps, over time. Well, I, in my mind, it's more like an irradiated substance, like that, a yeah, small amount. Yeah, it goes. Sure, and exactly. you need a tiny amount once it gets into your system, it like attaches to your body and. There she goes. Yeah, the issue with that kind of attack on someone really is predictability. Like, you don't know, you know, Navalny or Navalny, for instance, uh, when he got 
polonium poisoning, it didn't kill him. But yeah, so long answer short, uh, we know people have probably attempted it just because over the course of targeted uh, killings, people have tried pretty much anything you could imagine. Makes perfect sense. Just that, that kind of claim by such a you know unilateral <laughs> despot, like you mentioned, uh, strikes me as the, the stuff of paranoia um, to a degree. But I, I do understand what you're saying, that it certainly is possible. Good to clarify. Thank you. Well, he had reason to be paranoid, I would say. But yeah, uh, <laughs> very much so. Yeah. Also, yeah. people do just get cancer. 100%. So how, how about we uh, get a little bit of a rundown of some of the the stats surrounding Venezuela first, and then we'll move on to uh, the one that maybe people know even less about. Yep. So Venezuela, the uh, full name is the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. It's pretty big, especially it's the Goliath to the David of Guiana. It's got a po- it's uh, about 916 ish square clicks population of 29 million. So smaller than the U.S. for for comparison. Uh, It is an opponent of uh, many U.S. regimes. That's one thing both sides of the U.S. political aisle agreed upon for many years. Uh, That's why most of the stuff you see about Venezuela in Western news is going to look at economic woes, inflation, uh, shortages, speculation in oil, allegations of massive corruption. And Venezuela is of particular interest to the powers that be in Latin America and across the world because it has the largest oil reserves on the planet. Isn't that crazy? More than Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Sorry, KSA. What's crazier, too, is still is that we people don't seem to know that in general. Well, it isn't talked about in the same way as it is about the Middle East. And, and it's really interesting because the United States very publicly entered the Middle East several times over the course of the last 30, 40 years. So it's like it's weird in that we haven't entered Venezuela in the same way. Don't there's been, been, officially entered. There's been some actions, right? <laughs> but never a war or anything like that. Is our relationship a little cozier with South America in general, or is that an over well, a gross generalization? Right? Cozy the way like an abusive stepfather <laughs> has a cozy relationship with their kids. Ah, oh, dear. There are a um, lot, they live in the same house. There are a lot of beatings and a lot of opinions about what the kids can, can or cannot do. Last question, maybe beyond the scope of today's episode, but the uh, I, I couldn't help but notice the Bolivarian part. Yeah. Bolivia is, of course, also a, quite a large country in South America, but it's on the opposite border. Yeah, so, it's not. It's no, not about Bolivia. No connection at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's really interesting, and again, it's just it's like world history that maybe we were taught at some point, but probably has left most of our minds. Just about how when Colombia was officially formed, I think Ecuador and Venezuela, there are, it was one state that was then broken up at one point. Um, but yeah, a Bolivarian revolution, there's a whole history to that as well. Simon Bolivar, the yep. Venezuelan oh, leader who led what are now some of those countries you named, Matt. Uh, and the guy's a, a legend in his time. Uh, he was instrumental in the escape from colonialism, the move toward independence for these countries. It was Colombia, by the way. I, I misspoke. I, I named a, one of the countries wrong, but Colombia was the other country that was formed. Ah, yes. I Sorry. think it's no. I think you got like Peru, Panama, Bolivia, two Ecuador, Venezuela. Venezuela is well, the main one. It, well, yeah, it was the one that formed Venezuela. <laughs> anyway, I got something wrong. You have to look it up because I don't know my stuff. Sorry. Well, it's independence from the Spanish Empire. That's our big takeaway. That's the shadow of colonialism looms large. It wasn't the U.S. this time. Uh, it was a, a fight against these European powers. And something similar happened with Guyana. Guyana is right next door. Pull up a world map, play along at home. It's fascinating because if you look at a digital map, uh, you'll see the mileage may vary. But anyway, this place, full name, Cooperative Republic of Guyana, you hear about it way less often in the West. And to be honest, there's not a ding on anyone. A lot of folks might have a tough time finding it on a world map. I mean, it's confusing because like there are three countries named some variation of Guinea. And there's French Guiana, and then there's this Guiana, which is spelled differently. Like, it gets confusing. It's an understandable thing. Also, this is a blink-and-you-miss-it country, if you're looking at the entirety of South America. It's an itty-bitty thing. It's the third smallest country on that continent. 
Uh, I think the only smaller ones are Suriname, which is right next door, and Uruguay. And uh, this place, even though it's very, very tiny, it's also one of the least densely populated countries on the planet. Very rural. High, high amount of wilderness, jungle, biodiversity, uh, and it's all packed into just like 83,000 square miles, 250,000 kilometers. Uh, it's, it's weird, though, because like the digital map, if you guys pull it up, anybody playing along at home, if you pull it up now on your, let's say you go to uh, Google Maps or Google Earth, when you look at the map of Guyana, you'll see that it has a typical border uh, demarcating the country, but then a little bit to the right of center, it has another thing that looks like a border line. It's as if you looked at a map of the U S and the Mississippi was also somehow an international border. Yeah, it, it is. It is the, uh, the river, right? Mm, the, the, Esquiba. The, the Esquiba river. Okay. So that's going to factor in heavily as we continue through this story. Um, which again, we can't stress enough. If you look at it, Ben isn't joking. It goes through and cuts this thing well in over half. So, uh, so most of the country of Guyana is to the West of that line and, and closer then, to Venezuela. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's just keep, let's yeah. keep that in mind. <laughs> so, so, uh, no matter what the news might imply, these two countries have a long history of, uh, not quite getting along. Uh, Guyana also is, uh, they, I think it was first Dutch. Then the British were running stuff. And just like the Falklands, the British, empire still has its vestiges active so when our boy maduro comes out and says hey this is venezuela it's always been venezuela he's hearkening back to earlier stuff he didn't just like what's that what's that drug that makes people that made people uh talk trash on twitter ambien Jeez, yeah, yeah, that's that what it that makes, <laughs> well, it makes you. It makes you make weird sandwiches in the night, uh, and also apparently say things that you regret and have no recollection of. If you're a celebrity who had a bad day on Twitter, yeah, my mom used to take Ambien, and we'd get home, and we stayed with her briefly when my kid was born. Uh, we'd come home from being out, and uh, she'd be up making like peanut butter and mustard sandwiches and uh, talking absolute nonsense. Mm. Uh, I'll try the uh, I'll, I'll I'll try a peanut butter mustard sandwich. Who knows? But but you're right. Like this this statement he's making, as wild as it may sound, it does refer back to a centuries long dispute. This border territory around the river you mentioned, Matt, the Esquiba River, it's sixty two thousand square miles. And they said, look, that's Venezuela. It's always been Venezuela. Why are you playing? They tried to gaslight an entire country. Actually, yeah. two entire countries. Well, and just listen to that number. 62,000 square miles of area. All of Guyana is 83,000 square right. miles. Right. So that's like, we'll take half your country plus, yeah. oh, you know what? How about a whole, let's take another third. <laughs> it's like Canada say, we've looked at the map and uh, based on our objective estimate, everything north of Tennessee in a straight line is actually Canada. Right. Yeah. You have three months to move. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's such, it's a it's a nuts thing to even state, right? Even if it is going back to this, you know, the eighteen hundreds, eighteen ninety nine or eighteen thirty, mm -hmm. like going way back, it's still crazy to come forward and just say, "Yo, uh, most of your country's ours, actually." Run so. it, run the jewels. <laughs> uh, they also said, uh, you know, because the, what's the deal with that? Why do a half measure? They also said. And the water offshore is also ours, has also been part of this. Uh, and that's because during the Latin American Wars of Independence, which you mentioned earlier, uh, Venezuela pulled a Game of Thrones little finger move and said chaos is a ladder. And they did claim about two thirds of Guyana's land, but they got caught. And they couldn't do it because everybody else was like, come on, man, we're supposed to be the good guys in this narrative. That's no. sort of a dick move, dude. But there's this whole other thing. And I don't know, Ben, are we going to get into it? There's this whole thing where this whole process that we're talking about and, and uh, decades and decades, centuries of dispute here is actually one of the primary things that sets the United States up as a world power because because of the in the dispute. 
the U.S. basically stepped up to the United Kingdom, to, to Great Britain, and said, actually, no, the Monroe Doctrine is the way to go, and this is the way the border should be. And they were like, man, we should fight a war with you. But they were also like, uh, actually, we can't really fight another war right yeah. now. So, all right, yeah. you, you can have it. <laughs> because their resources were expended across yeah. the globe. It's it's expensive to uh, project force like that, which is also part of the story, right? But, but it's one of the reasons the United States kind of, or as again, as though it's an entity of itself, the powers within the United States, the leaders decided, oh, we can actually, we can have a say in some of these global things like disputes mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And become more internationalist. And then also let us not forget millions upon millions of people are living in Latin America and they're going, Hey, we're also in the f room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we, we live, this is actually our room that yeah. you guys are fighting over. Why did these guys break into our house and start arguing about the, you know, the, the feng shui is off in here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're referring to, we're referring to something called the Arbitral Award of 1899. Sorry to messed up name. Guyana is still part of the British Empire. And they say, they go back to this constantly and they say, look, that's the agreement. Remember when these Europeans came in and did everything? Surveyed they, the land. Surveyed the land, which was a big, big deal. Shout out to ridiculous history episodes there. Um, we saw immediately that Venezuela bucked at this. They actually called it, quote, an Anglo-Russian conspiracy. Uh, so they are the first to allege conspiracy, even though colonialism is a conspiracy. Uh, by 1962, they said, OK, guys, enough time has passed. That decision was BS. We don't respect it because this has always been Venezuela. You know, aren't you fighting those European colonists with us? What happened to unity? Give us all your stuff. Yeah. Well, should we also bring up uh, just the idea of resources? We mentioned that Venezuela has the largest oil. Uh, it is the most oil rich country on the planet. Right. And then also that was found in Ven Venezuela and especially in this region that's in dispute is gold. Ah, yes. Yeah. The resource curse is yeah. true, right? And for So they gave it 60 years and then they're like, mm, there's gold over there, you said? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we need to we need to look at this again. <laughs> also, yeah, similar to the Darien Gap, you know, when you have that much jungle coverage, uh, it's very difficult to build infrastructure and it's very difficult to enforce laws. So there's a lot of smuggling operations, a lot of illegal mining operations, and those mining operations um the illegal ones have a lot of powerful entities who want them to continue the big they're not fighting over you know osha standards or workers rights they're fighting over who gets that stuff pulled from the ground shout out black monday murders exactly well then a little spoiler here what happens if you as a country that is not officially in control of that land starts giving like uh citizenship to people who are living in on that land Right. Well, no, they're actually our citizens living over there. Right. What? Like, right. This this thing gets so twisted. Or <laughs> or you start giving concessions, legal rights to mine to uh, to private entities, and you just it happens to be for a country that is not yours, yeah. the soil that is not part of your thing. So it's <laughs> it's getting nasty. The idea is there uh, for several decades, different times. Venezuela was saying, well, why don't we just behave as though. It is Venezuela, and then eventually we can not just gaslight Guyana, but the world. And That'll work so. <laughs> long term. Work. Right? Yeah, sure. If I keep showing up to the like squatters' rights, they're doing squatters' rights. If I keep showing up to this house long enough, someone will say it's mine. It's one, yeah. of those, it's one of those rhetorical devices, too, where if you repeat the lie long enough and with enough confidence, maybe it'll take. Uh, people will start to believe it as the truth and not, you know, fact check you like we recommended doing. But it seems like an awful uh, risky move. Yeah. So we said then in the 60s. So that was 1899 all the way up to like or the early 1960s. Right. That, that was that that was a span of time when Venezuela just said, OK, we'll just deal with these borders as they are. 1962, they said, actually, we have a problem. Then in 1966, they took it to the, the United Nations. Right. Or Wait, well, I don't. They international took it to the, bodies, yeah. They took it to international bodies. I know the United Nations or the UN started stepping in early in the process to try and negotiate to be almost a middleman mm -hmm. for the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And 
you guys, it hasn't stopped since Never. since nineteen what sixty six? Yeah, since nineteen sixty six, when the UK, Venezuela, and Guyana sent representatives together to try to map out the borders. And the problem is, in any negotiation, if you're not uh, if you're if you're negotiating in good faith, there has to be some give and take. Turned yeah. out that wasn't the case. Uh, and so the uh, Venezuelan government, uh, under different iterations, co- had one constant, which was to uh, to try to depower Guyana internationally, like prevent them from being members of the uh, of the like the OAS or the United Nations, uh, try to keep them out of touching on any judiciary bodies internationally, like the ICJ, International Court of Justice. It's a dumb name, but they try to do good work. And this just went back and forth over and over until Venezuela said, ah, we might just invade. We had a little kind of rigged vote about it. They are essentially saying if the courts and the world at large won't give us all the stuff we want, we are just going to take it. That is a very, very um, (laughs) what we would call in diplomacy. It is a provocative statement. It is somewhat bellicose and it carries a lot of possible consequence and cost. So they had to decide it was worth it. Why? Why did they make this wild ass decision or even bring it up? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Gold, but not just gold. Oil, black yep. gold, Texas tea, etc. The Whee! gunk that to this day moves the modern world. Uh, <laughs> Guyana, yeah, well, all the, the golds, all the golds, <laughs> all of Sorry. the all the gold you can imagine. Black gold makes me want to whoop and holler. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a you know Beverly Hillbillies. For anybody unfamiliar, has a neat, catchy little. Hollywood hillbilly theme well, as sure. an intro. Yeah, it's, um, one, it's another one of those ones that describes the plot of the show in the th- right. In the song. That's what I was gonna those. say. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's like the nanny. Uh, it's like the Mr. Belvedere stuff. Uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I enjoy those much more than the actual show. No question. Yeah. Just so <laughs> Guyana, um, to those in the know, um, is often referred to as the new Qatar, and Venezuela reactivated that claim to the territory uh, after finding some 11 billion barrels of oil, recoverable oil and natural gas, off of Guyana's coast. So the government then held a super controversial referendum referendum on this issue uh in december and uh early, de- early december last right. year mm-hmm. mm, and and that was after guiana had gone to the guiana knew this was coming it's just it was originally called uh, a referendum means that if they're enacted in good faith the government is asking the people hey what do you guys think about this right like they're saying hey kids do we want pizza or do we want, you know, we want to get lasagna or something. However, this is not a, uh, there are some serious problems, as you mentioned, with the referendum itself. And it goes super deep in the weeds because people have been looking at this. Guyana was trying to get international bodies not to allow this referendum to happen, which is already kind of tricky, right? It's like how South Korea has this law that says if you are a South Korean national, you can't gamble yeah. anywhere in the world. Did you yeah. know that? That's so crazy. <laughs> I don't know how you enforce that. Uh, I don't know, man. But I've I've been I keep thinking about how nuts this would be if it was just two neighbors, right? In a mm-hmm. house, like mm-hmm. one house next to the other house. And one one that you guys have always had problems with where the fence should be, you know? Right. But, yeah. But like all of a sudden one of the neighbors discovers like incredible stuff in their backyard. Like, oh my God, there's this cave system down there and there's resources inside it. And the neighbor's like, um, actually we're, we're going to have a little vote. <laughs> and, uh, I think that's actually mine. So Kids, you, you, come downstairs. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to vote in our house about your territory. Your house. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy because um, when people who do election monitoring looked at this, the, they found, they found the number Venezuela offered to the world, which was 95% approval to take over this part of Guyana. Uh, They found that that just didn't hold up. And it looked like it looked like if it was 95% of voters, it was less than 10% of the population. So you have to, you have to be careful with those statistics. And well, and it's almost like having a a vote on whether or not we should go to war, basically. Mm -hmm. 
And so, like, how what what does that have to do with anybody else besides your own country deciding it's going to go to war? Like, it's also yeah. like doing the war vote at uh CPAC, you know, or at uh like at a aerospace defense industry meeting and say <laughs> like, okay, you guys vote though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Should we just we need buy to buy more nukes. Yeah. Just need to check the temp of the old room here. Exactly. Uh, all exactly. you weapons manufacturers. Or I, I read something recently, I can't remember what it was. It was it was a more conservative publication where they had this they were like, this report shows that as a matter of fact, workers are very excited about returning to the office. And I looked into it, and the <laughs> study was conducted by an architectural firm that builds offices. Uh -oh. So you, you got to look at that stuff. Anyway, uh, Giada is already having a game-changing moment with this oil because one of the important words there we don't want to miss is recoverable. You can get this stuff out and and still make a profit off of it so there are other places in the world where there's a ton of some sort of fossil fuel but it's just right now too expensive to get it and uh yeah or you have yeah. to use something like fracking uh exclusively to get to it right which mm -hmm. is it, not as great as just being able to get that oil get at that oil mm -hmm. uh, in, let's say in more traditional ways Sure. Yeah. Hey, Beverly Hillbilly style. Yeah. yeah. Just put Pump a spike it. in the ground and then build a little, a neat little mini, uh, and build an oil derrick around it. But, uh, I was going to call it a mini Eiffel tower. That doesn't work. But, <laughs> uh, right now, Guyana is creating 400,000 something barrels per day of oil, uh, and gas. And they're going to make more than 1 million barrels per day. Uh, very soon in 2027. So this is huge for a small country's economy, and it's going to change people's lives in a measurable way. The question is, you know, if we're all neighbors, if we survived colonialism, if we have a shared history of fighting for independence, well, Venezuela, are you being a hater? Like, why? Why, why are you flipping the script? Don't you... Don't you literally have more oil than anybody in the world already? It's it's a weird question. Like, why is this why is this the fight? Uh part of it is because the US has made it very expensive and costly for the Venezuelan government to exist. Uh production in oil has fallen significantly. There are all kinds of allegations of corruption. The infrastructure is bad. You know, people who can leave Venezuela, and I'm sure we have a lot of Venezuelan listeners today, uh, people who can leave Venezuela have been doing so en masse. It's just very difficult to live there now. Yeah. You know, something I, I was thinking about this morning, you guys, I didn't know Guyana is the only predominantly English-speaking mm -hmm. country in South America. Yeah. Which... For and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's major strategic interest by you know uh, the United States and the UK and other Western governments, but it feels as though maybe that's enough of a reason to really want to support the independence and um, continued growth of Guyana versus a country like Venezuela. Um, just when I'm thinking, sorry, I, I, this is kind of random thought here, but I'm just, I'm imagining as all of this is heating up, like maybe, maybe there is some kind of strategic interest that is simply based in the language of the people spoken in Guyana. That's part of it. Yeah. There's that colonial, uh, well, there's that, that history, right? So they are mm -hmm. part of the Anglosphere. I would advance also, um, maybe that is a, a facet of the larger thing which is Guyana is a U.S. friendly country. And yeah. so if Guyana mm -hmm. has access to that oil, then all of a sudden it's much easier, it's easier to work with them than it is to say, work with some of our friends out East uh, or, you know, these other things. Now, of course, obviously the U.S. creates its own oil, its own fossil fuels, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's nice to have, have someone that you could have a, a cool conversation with or whatever America sees as that instead of a, um, instead of a thing that could almost always go sideways. So I think that's maybe part of it. But also, when we look at Venezuela's motivations, sure, you already got all the oil in the world. Don't you want a little more? I mean, you could. they could definitely use the cash. It would definitely bolster the reputation of the Maduro government. And I posit that is one of the big, big things. I think that might be the actual thing. 
uh, because he's coming down hard. He said Guyana can't sell the rights to uh, explore or drill for oil here. Uh, he also did not say specifically which areas of Guyana should be under control. Everybody knows what he's talking about, but he doesn't want to like paint himself into a corner. Instead, he said, without telling you exactly which areas I think are Venezuela, if you are working with Guyana in the oil trade right now, you have three months to leave. GTFO. And the clock is ticking. Yeah, and these are the big boys, too. These are like the BPs, the Exxons, et cetera. If an invasion uh, were to occur, however, Guyana uh, would not be in a very advantageous position. I believe the term you used, Ben, uh, in the research was thicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, their army is just about 5,000 strong, um, meaning that they would be very quickly overtaken unless a much larger power came to their aid. Yeah, and the thing that is in dispute, right, is offshore. So if you imagine the, if you look at Guyana on the map, just the northern border, right, is the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And as we know, naval na uh, naval powers are very strong in countries often that have large oil supplies. Doesn't mean that Venezuela's naval, you know, uh, force is the strongest. The U.S. is, is like, what? How I forget how many times stronger the U.S. Navy is than any other country but it's insane the u.s uh, navy is crazy it's the uh it's the u.s navy is the world's second largest air force in yeah. addition to being the, navy. the first is the usaf so but they don't even really factor into here it's just like venezuela has a lot of coastline has a lot of shipping has a lot of reasons to have very strong forces on the water and if they were to you know have a dispute and an actual hot war, they would be coming in so much, not even just the 5,000 member army, but the ships and the weapons that would be, that Guyana would be facing would be tremendous. Yeah. And the army for Venezuela, I think as of like 19, 2020, it's like 343,000 versus 5,000. It's a little significant. It's tough. It's tough. And again, that's not a ding on the people in, uh, in Guyana's armed services. That's just the math, and the math is scary. So like you're saying, a larger power would have to step in to help to prevent this from being an absolute just <clears throat> one-sided massacre, honestly. Well, again, and I mean, yeah. and there are only uh, so many candidates for who that larger power might be, right? Right, exactly. Uh, because we can name some people who won't come in to help, uh, China, Russia, probably. Um, I don't know. Brazil is a very interesting question for this one. But yeah, we don't because uh, just to, as a reminder of the geography there, they are just south. Like all, you know, Brazil has so many different like states within it, but the entirety of Brazil is below Guiana and Venezuela. And, right there. And Lula wants to maintain peace in the region, right? So they would definitely have a stake in this. We haven't mentioned the president of Guyana yet, Irfan Ali. Uh, Ali is going through, Ali knows all this, obviously, and is going through the correct theoretical international channels, went to the United Nations, International Court of Justice, talked to the UN Security General, and he's like, hey, Maduro is unhinged, guys. We need something to happen. Here, here is my country, Guyana. We're playing by the rules. We're doing everything we were told we should do. Help. And so uh, we can say at this point, no invasion has occurred. However, it for quite some time, it seemed very close. Uh, we'll have some good news at the end, but right now it's sort of like if there were a doomsday clock for this, the world would have been at two minutes to midnight. And in late December, the United Kingdom dispatched a Royal Navy patrol vessel to Guyana just to sort of swim around the waters. Like in, uh, in simulation games, like in civilization, you want to repel other forces. So you just start sort of putting your boats out, you know, putting your troops out in these different areas, kind of like holding a parking space in a crowded mall when people used to go to malls. Uh, but now the question but with is, guns, uh, but with, with very large guns. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like going to a mall in Texas today. 
Um, I love going to malls. I'm still, I'm a mall walker. I love a, I love a dead mall too, or a dying mall. It's sort of a, a an interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm excursion. okay with those because they're less crowded. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. The, the North Decab Mall here in Decatur is a great example. Number one spot for Bollywood films. I was just going to say the Sabaro game at Dead Malls is kind of weak, so I'm not, oh, I'm not really into it. I thought they were consistent. <laughs> it's adva- advantages, disadvantages, pros, cons, cost, benefit. I, I say with that in mind, let's, uh, let's pause for word from our sponsors and get to one of the big questions, why now? All right. Why now? You might be saying, well, it's because of the oil dummies. Uh, the oil discovery is new, but itself, it's not that new. Instead of a conspiracy to control more of the fossil fuel market, it feels like the conspiracy here is to shore up Maduro's government and get the people to support them because there were serious problems with that vote. A crooked vote is nothing new in Venezuela, nor in Latin America, nor in the world overall, if we're being honest. But Maduro took this one referendum as a mandate and ran with it. And if you ask folks like, uh, if you ask policy wonks, which I mean is a compliment, like Anderson Siquiera uh, over at a political analysis firm based in Venezuela, you'll see them say stuff like, The government's only options are to try to rile up national sentiments and escalate the situation because it helps them increase political repression and it helps them persecute anybody who is an opponent of Maduro. Sort of like, and this might be a hot take, but it's very true, sort of like how uh, in the wake of the attacks of September 11th in the U.S., uh, politicians who aligned with the current president had to field day saying like you're a, you're un-American if you disagree with me and my party about anything, right? Yeah. You support terrorists if you think school lunch should be affordable. Yeah. Well, and also remember what comes along with a hot conflict. Like if they actually did go to war with Guyana, the the money that would be spent on building a war machine even larger so that they could you know, as the country itself could maintain security internally while fighting a war across the way, right? And all of these, all of the contractors that get paid, all of the, it, there's just so much money that gets generated or at spent, let's say, during war, which, and we, we kind of know this about money, um, you do kind of have to borrow it from somebody, but you can also kind of just print it in some ways. So, For a little while, yeah. So it's interesting, like, the way you can you can make things better for a little bit often, as you're saying there, Ben, when you go to war. I mean, it's always a great way to get reelected, unfortunately. Yep. And, and even, even things that are problematic democracies or democracies in names only, dino. I mean, some different, but the, uh, the idea here is that you make up an enemy of them and you rally your people behind it at that point, as crazy as it sounds at that point, it doesn't really matter if you win the conflict, it matters that you get the support to wage the conflict and then rationalize the outcome to an increasingly isolated public. That's how fascism works. Right. And that's, what's so brilliant about it. I also know, uh, <laughs> I still <laughs> I shouldn't do it, but I still read The Economist, and uh, they had an article that speaks to what your point was about about borrowing money. They had a very tone-deaf article that came out, out pretty recently where they were like, what would World War III mean for investors? That's <laughs> not, not kidding. Not The Onion. That's Gangbusters. The that's what oh, it would boy. mean. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, okay, so that's the idea. Like, is this just a push for support? You know, something akin to a culture war and then a hot war all mixed up, right? To keep to keep people from coming out in the streets with torches and pitchforks and overthrowing you. So, yeah. Ben, yeah. Ben, it's also like the situation in Crimea in my mind. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a dispute in, in somebody else's land that you felt like was once yours in some way, right? With the two right. disputing countries. Stalin, and it, 1954. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, then, and then how Crimea was taken back over mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's just, 
To me, it feels like we're moving to another one of those. I'm sorry, I just want to put that out there. That's perfect. I think that's a perfect comparison, man, because, you know, uh, the Putin administration was encountering terrible, terrible problems, very similar problems. And now there's a, there's a war in another country. And like, if you disagree, you're a very bad person. You're un-Russian. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I like if 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 we said this, though, if Venezuela actually did invade and this isn't just a, a cynical fascist attempt to support a failing government, then several things would happen. If Guyana has no on the ground foreign support, like your point, Noel, Venezuela will win instantly. It will simply happen and the world will have to deal with it later uh, if and, and if that happens. Venezuela will pay a heavy price geopolitically, but what what's the nature of that? Is that does that mean toothless condemnation? The UN writes an angry letter and says you can't come to the pizza party because they'll still sell the oil. It's weird though because they're already kind of not invited to the pizza party, and they exactly. haven't been for a long time. The sanctions, right? Yeah. So I mean, what? Wow. What really is the major price? It's that's the. Thing, it might be a little bit more of a discount than we think. There are there are sanctions related to Venezuela, um, and a lot of sanctions that are that get applied to different countries come from the U.S. directly. Uh, but even in those cases, people, other governments and companies, they they need fossil fuels still, so they're going to buy them. You can still make a buck off of it. Uh, we know that. Uh, I don't know. The, the The more chaotic thing is what happens if Venezuela invades and then a third party intercedes. That's very frightening. At first, it sounds like, oh, the good guys, America's police. And that may, to a degree, be somewhat true. But it also means this could escalate into a proxy war. We don't know what Venezuela's allies would provide, but it'd be enough to make things ugly. There would be a blood price. And then the people who would fight in that that third party which would probably be the united states if we're being honest their resources would be spread increasingly thin you know this would like if i were interested if we were hanging out and we we're waiting for a good time it's be a good time to get a little closer to taiwan right because yeah. the, the boats are somewhere else it's true know? and did we did we say that china is venezuela's primary receiver of exported oil we so- did not <laughs> Well, we should we should say that mm. China receives around four hundred and thirty thousand barrels per day of oil from Venezuela, which does mean uh, they were. I, it does mean they would be the ones. China would be the one who would say, "Hey, hold on, hold on, maybe I've got to do something here, right?" And when we're talking about a proxy war that becomes larger with bigger players, um, that's what it could be. Could be, yeah. And then also, if you are a certain Russian dictator, not naming names, hoping to get some distractions from, say, a failing war in, hypothetically, Ukraine, then chaos like this is fantastic because it dilutes your opponent's resources. It spreads them further across and further away from your particular conflict. It also shifts international attention and therefore political will away from opposing you. So this is, I don't know. Like we can play the game where this spins out further and further and further. And each of these if thens is troubling, but how likely is it to occur? I, I don't know. Fascism just needs an external enemy, a thing for you to fight against. Right? Oh my gosh. That's a really interesting thing that you mentioned. I was listening to a, a podcast with um, Adam Conover the other day, mm-hmm. and he was mm-hmm. just talking about the history of the right and uh, talking about how oftentimes, you know, historically the right has been a reaction to being disenfranchised, like of, of the wealthy, maybe kind of having things taken away from them. Um, and then creating a situation where they have a perceived enemy uh, and they want to kind of crib from the other side that created the situation that took the things away from them in order to get the things back. And in order to do that, they have to have a perceived enemy. Uh, and that's just a really, you know, important touchstone in that kind of rhetoric and that kind of sort of political gaslighting and maneuvering. Yeah, you just need the eternal war. And the problem is with people who are are fans of fascist ideology and tactics is it's a lot like 
it's a lot like playing a dark lottery. It's it's riding uh, or it's trying to ride a bull, right? It's an unpredictable thing because the nature, the specific nature of the enemy will always shift once you kind of deplete the first one. And then eventually it's going to be your turn in the stone chair. So that's why, mm. that's why fascism <laughs> is not sustainable. Stone uh, chairs are the sacrifice for anyone. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, following yeah along. <laughs> it just sounds cool. I don't know. <laughs> God. But, uh, but luckily, I don't know. It seems like they are seeking de-escalation. So all this is hypothetical right now. Yeah. It's, it's weird to me that a dispute like this can be so long going. Like it, the dispute really hasn't stopped since 1899 and the international court of justice has officially had something in front of them since 2018 that they've just been mulling over since 2018. Like, Oh guys, come on. We really got to decide what's happening here. And it just hasn't happened, Mm -hmm. which is just, it's to me, it's, it's crazy. that It could be a five year long, like court battle. Right. (laughs) <laughs> right. Well, Venezuela also considers ICJ a kangaroo court. Yeah. So it, you can it, do that when you're a country. You could just say, <laughs> I reject this court. Imagine getting a parking ticket and saying, like, uh, you know, traffic court of Atlanta, malarkey. Everybody knows it. You guys are clowns. Yeah. I and don't, not I don't respect your entire international justice system. Sorry. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Oh, geez. You guys just reminded me that I have to show up for jury duty on Monday. Blarg. Nice. Tell, uh, if you don't want to do it, uh, whenever they ask you a question, talk about jury nullification. It's your one way ticket out. I did. I tried last time and they totally picked me. I also said, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> they said, if there's anything that would pre- prevent me from being objective. Um, it was a case surrounding uh, police or, or whatever. And I said, I'm actually the co-host of a, conspiracy podcast and we objectively do not trust the government and that wasn't enough to get me struck wow wow yeah. maybe it was the, de- desperate, maybe it was the defense asking you that question they desperate no <laughs> it wasn't like, i swear good. um anyhow uh, maybe well, i'll try it again this time but I, mm. anyway well the thing is right now there is some good news we can end on the leaders of venezuela and guiana had a recent Day long meeting, what corporate America would call an offsite, a summit, and it resulted in a declaration that they both signed, or I shouldn't say declaration, a joint statement, they would call it, where they said, Look, we don't get along. Venezuela is like, We're totally right. And Guiana's like, That's a lie. We're totally right. However, we can agree that we're not going to use force against each other. The question is, how long? That's going to hold. Instead, they said, you know what we're going to do? Because it worked so great over the past few centuries. We're going to put together a little team, a little team of bureaucrats, and they're going to figure it out peacefully. Sounds good. And surely the 48th millionth time is the charm, right? Isn't that what they say in baseball? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, that's a quote for our pal, Max. Uh, But, also, at the same time, like how often can you trust the statements of these various countries? Can you trust the statements of Venezuela? Because, true story, the Venezuelan government has already ordered new maps that include land from Guyana as part of Venezuela. Which part, you might ask? Oh, well, it's the ones with the oil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're super into that whole region we talked about where, where Escuba, that one river Escuba. cuts through most of the country. Yeah, somewhere between two thirds and three fourths. And look, obviously, when I feel like it's important for us to say this, whenever we talk about governmental actions, we are not talking about the people living in these countries. No, the people living in these countries are chill. They want the same stuff anybody else in any other part of the world wants. They also probably have serious issues with world governments, with their own government. And they are not the people who want a war overwhelmingly throughout history. No, uh, there's a great, uh, can we shout out a couple articles just for people to sure. check out? Uh, yeah. There's, there's one in Al Jazeera. I would just send everybody to, it's one of the more recent stories that was written about this on January 11th, written by Nazima Ragubir. And it is titled fears simmer in Esquibo region as Venezuela eyes, the disputed territory. It's just, there's so many written like this, and they have been really since, uh, I guess, early December of last year, right? That that give a pretty good overview of what's happening on, on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a really good point too. And uh, uh, a an American representative also visited. They're seeking a bureaucratic solution at this point. And I know bureaucratic, the word bureaucracy has some connotations uh, for ineffectiveness and it's earned those connotations to a degree, but still that's better than a hot war. You know, um, Guyana is not a wealthy country. The people who live there for the most part aren't the people who, and people of Venezuela, they're not the people who can afford to say, oh, fiddle dee dee, there's a war. I guess I'll go summer in Monaco. You know, we have to exercise humanity with this stuff and we can't put oil barrels over that. But as a society, we do. Really got Guyana over an oil barrel. Uh, and on that oh. note thank you as always so much for tuning in folks let's, let's end on a good one uh, we can't wait to hear your thoughts if you have first hand experience visiting uh, living in Guyana and Venezuela uh, if you have ties with these countries this region let us know we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, we try to be easy to find online that's right. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on uh, Facebook, where we have our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. We are also Conspiracy Stuff on X, uh, FKA Twitter. Um, and you can also find us at that handle on YouTube. We are Conspiracy Stuff Show, however, on Instagram and TikTok. And be on the lookout for uh, new social media, short form videos, and maybe even some longer form stuff coming in the new year. Hey, if you've got a moment, why not head to our YouTube channel and check out the videos we made on Hugo, Hugo Chavez back in, ugh, mm -hmm. I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe mm -hmm. we yeah. made those videos. Um, go check those out because there's really interesting information in there about, again, maybe how the country was going, what the fears were, at least at the top of the chain uh, 10 years ago. Also, the U.S. definitely did dirt in Venezuela, just to be very clear. The US oh yeah, did bad stuff. Yeah, the the CIA <laughs> that made the fact book. <laughs> anyway, it's fine. Everything's fine. Call our number one eight three three S T D W Y T K. It's a voicemail system. You've got three minutes. When you do call in, give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your name and message on one of our listener mail episodes. If you got more to say, you got an attachment, maybe some links. Why not instead shoot us an email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.